Hello, fictional. Welcome to the What If Issei. Today we are gonna see, What If Issei is Son of the Acnologia. Part 2. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Lavender Town's hospital was honestly not up to standards. Mages rarely ever visited the town, and people rarely got into accidents, so their ability to care for Gilderts was sorely lacking. On the plus side, there was no wait, and it wasn't busy. But magic, medical facilities were capable of fantastic wonders, such as installing fully functioning prosthetic limbs, even if hospital was somewhat unprepared. The crash mage had two of those artificial wooden limbs now, inciting a pirate joke from Drake. Thanks to Acnologia, Issei was pretty beat up over the entire situation. Currently, Drake and Issei were in the recovery room, keeping their new friend company. Turns out, Drake and Gilderts were shockingly similar, minus the whole species aspect. The nurse had even asked if they were brothers at one point, probably because of the hair color. Their baffled reactions were a welcome source of laughter from Issei. You know, Drake, Gilderts began, you two really didn't have to accompany me. But it's nice that you did. What else were we supposed to do? Our home was destroyed, and Acnologia flew away great red nose where. Besides, I think Issei's got man crush on you, the Welsh dragon teased. Issei was immediately on the defensive. I like women, you jerk. Trust me, Yauv made that abundantly clear, his uncle assured, and the brunette knew exactly what he was insinuating. Erg, Issei groaned. Why do you always have a comeback? Every time, every dang time. And Issei knew he was absolutely not a pervert, no matter what that jerk said. Bildertz grinned. Things like this reminded him of fairy tale. You may be a tough fighter, but you are decades too young to win a battle of wit. There was a short silence following that, when the mage decided it was about time to head home. He swung his legs over the bed and stood hesitantly. When the fake leg held, he went back to his casual posture. Thanks for your help. Now that I know this quest is a dead end, I'm going back to report into the guild. It's been three years, and I'm sure everything's changed. I guess you could call it a dead end, Drake agreed. Fighting that dragon is dangerous, even for me. So you're leaving? Issei addressed the recuperating mage. Yep, kid. Fairy tales my home. I've got Issei thinking about home. Not Mount Zonia, but Kuo Japan. Now that his reason for staying flew away, he could go back to his homeworld, where he belonged. There were answers there, about his real parents, and even Drake's explanations of fallen angels won't change that. He was too young and too traumatized to remember what happened, and some newly reawakened part of him wondered if his mother could be alive. Or, he ventured to consider, his father, since he never really did see the man die. What are you thinking so hard about? Drake asked. I want to go back to Kuo. Bilderts chose to interject. Kuo? Never heard of that place before. Most people haven't, the Welsh dragon replied. It is a long way from Fiori. The mage hummed in response, thoughts trailing away from the conversation. You do look a bit like a foreigner. Then again, Fiori's population was so diverse that everyone was completely different. Bragg sternly addressed to say. You can't run away from your problems, partner. I know, the teen sighed. Dad Acnologia was right on one thing, though. When I go back, it will be because I want to. He looked up at the ceiling and sighed. I've lived on a mountain for 13 years drag, running away from my problems. Bilderts was floored that Issei had never been to another part of Fiori. Lavender Town and a frigid mountain hardly compared to famous tourist attractions, such as the sunny beaches or the magnificent capital, Crocus. Even the forests by Magnolia would be an interesting and welcome change. Even though he felt strongly about this, he knew it was not his place to interject. He had met the boy a week ago, hardly cause to tell him how to live his life. You might regret the answers you find. If you lose everything, you could end up just like him. I've seen it before. When many of his previous hosts had activated Juggernaut Drive, the ultimate form of the boosted gear that granted incredible power at the cost of the user's life force, they had lost themselves completely. The last thing Drake wanted was to subject his partner to more pain, and finding out what the fate of his human parents was could end poorly. Like Acnologia. Issei growled out. Just say his name for once. He may have been my father, but I'm nothing like him. Only then did Issei realize that he was near yelling at the one person who stood by him. I've still got you, uncle, no matter what happens. Of course you do, the Red Dragon Emperor assured. When he thought about it, Issei losing it over the fate of his human parents might have been a stretch. If anything, the teen would shrug it off as a product of the human weakness Acnologia had loved to point out. Kid. Gildert surprised the two by commenting. A home is filled with people who you care about more than yourself. It doesn't matter where you go, as long as you find yourself someone you can love. That was one thing that fairy tale taught him. Even if he was a lone wolf that preferred peace and quiet, the guild held a place in his heart and would forever be somewhere he returned to. Issei's thoughts returned to when he was three years old. All he could remember about his old parents was his father's thick glasses. 
If that was his home so long ago, he at least owed the place a visit. Besides, like Gildert said, he would be with someone close, Drake. Drake, on the other hand, was a bit upset. I've lived millennia longer than him, and Hess so much wiser. Not cool. Maybe he was a little jealous that the mage swooped in and commanded so much respect from his nephew. Issei. That snagged the kid's attention quickly. I think this could be beneficial for you. In due for a return too, can't keep the white one waiting much longer, after all. But I need you to promise me something. The kid locked eyes with his uncle before the latter continued. I want you to live like a normal teenager. Yao go to school, make friends, whatever kids these days do. More than that, though, I want you to learn how to be a human, not a dragon. Pine, Issei relented. If it's just for a year. Just because he had a change of heart about his father, it didn't mean that he stopped considering humans weak. Gilderts was a clear exception, but going to school, Drake had told him all about the stupid human schools, seemed like a little bit of a stretch. Spending the last week riddled with guilt while Gilderts recovered had given him plenty of opportunity to reflect on his views of the world. Before, he would never have considered such a proposition. Humans were inconsequential, hardly something a chaos dragon should concern themselves with. Now, though, Issei knew that they weren't as weak as he was told. Willpower, Gilderts had told him, was something that humans had an abundance of, something that Issei had. Still, he was Acnologia's son, and he wasn't about to let the whole of humanity off that easy. When do you want to leave? Dreg asked. Once Gilderts is okay to go back to Fairy Tale. His sense of responsibility demanded that. The Ace Mage cut in again. You don't need to worry about me. See, I can walk perfectly fine on this thing. Gilderts claimed lightly, taking a step forward. Only then did he realize that he had no idea how to walk with the prosthetic leg, stumbling a little. When he tried to right himself, he slipped, landing on the floor. In a bout of carelessness, his crash magic shattered the floor beneath him. A -h -h -h. There was a shrill, feminine scream. Before the man knew what was happening, he had landed in a nurse's office. Get out. She yelled shoving him through the door and slamming it on his still working arm. Issei, barely refraining from giggling, fixed Dryag with a grin. I think waiting might be a good idea. Issei felt as if he might cry, not that he would or anything. Any self-respecting dragon would never display such weakness. Still, how else could he express the pain and overwhelming sadness that he felt? Gilderts was going to leave, to go back to Fairy Tail and give the guildmaster the grave news about the 100-year quest. Why would I feel this way? Issei tried to understand why he'd be so broken up over the human leaving, but he cold. Even going flying the day before Han cleared his head. They were standing a few miles out of the city, in the forest. Despite Drake's kind offer to fly the man to Magnolia, Gilderts had refused, preferring to walk instead. So, you guys are going home too? Fairy Tales Ace questioned. Seems so, Drake supplied. There is one problem though. The problem? There is always one of those, Gilderts complained. The fiery red magic circle appeared in the air, and the Welsh dragon reached in and pulled out a great tome. This thing has the spell to do it, but for some reason it only works when humans use it. The dragon had no idea why it was created that way, but it was a deadly tool for any one of the very few powerful humans on Earth. He only hoped that a long wielder would never find it. That is weird. Magic is magic after all, the mage reasoned. In Fiori, even non-mages could use spells stored in artifacts. Well this book, in contrast, seemed to draw from the user's magic and incantations to cast a spell. That's true. It's odd that you haven't asked why we need this to get home. It's odd that you are both dragons, Gilderts returned jokingly, but I don't care about that either. I'm getting too old to be surprised anymore. You won't believe the stuff that happens on paid jobs. While the ace mage's mind drifted off, Drake turned his attention to Issei. You haven't said a word, partner. No, I guess I haven't, the teen replied. Gilderts, he drew the man's attention, I will understand what you told me, I promise. Gilderts gave him a strange gesture, holding up his index finger and thumb. I would expect nothing less from you, kid. If we'd meet again, I'd love to see how you've grown. Issei grinned. Don't think you'll get a lucky punch in then, old man. Too bad we didn't get to finish, the mage lamented. Rarely, if ever did he have the change to go all out. He just caused too much destruction, like how Zonia Mountain was now nothing more than a mutilated pile of rubble. But next time, you won't have the luxury. The friendly banter reminded him of fairy tale and brought a short pang of homesickness. Awesome. Declared the teen. Well saddening that they were parting ways, with the promise of them meeting again, Issei could accept it. The loud cough drew the attention back to Drake. If you are both finished saying your goodbyes, I think we should get going. He was hit with a bunch of awes from the two. Gilderts, this page should have all you need to cast the spell. It claims that it works without prior experience, as long as the incantation and pentagram are flawless. 
while the spell had supposedly killed Issei's human father, Dreg saw no possibility that anything like that could happen to a mage as resilient as Gildert's. After all, the man was able to stand and talk while his left side was torn asunder. The mage cowered the text, his jaw dropping. I have no idea how to pronounce any of these words or draw a pentagram. In fact, he couldn't understand any of it, even if he did recognize the letters. That triggered an eye roll from the red dragon. I already drew the pentagram while the two of you were trash talking. Before either could protest, saying that it wasn't trash talking, Drake continued. Never mind. Issei, step next to me. Gildert's, when you finish reading, toss the spellbook back to us. Got it? Well, if I could go toe to toe with a dragon, it shouldn't be too hard to pronounce this insane language. Well, Issei smirked, his uncle sighed at the flawed logic. All right, then, let's get started. And so, Gildert struggled through four lines of Latin. And as the chant reached its close, the fairy tail mage tossed the book back to Drag, and the two dragons began glowing white, an immense amount of magic power flowing to them from Gildert's. Before the mage could process what was happening, they were gone. As the light died down, the two blinked to find themselves in a dusty old room, devoid of furniture. At one point, the place could have been called a home, but all that resided there now were spider webs and small rodents scurrying around. The white paint, if it can be called that, was chipped and split apart by cracks running down the wall, as if no maintenance whatsoever had been put into the house. A couple old boxes rested in the corner, for jettoned by the previous owner. Issei looked around, as if expecting to suddenly remember what it was like to grow up in this home. He tried to recall the face that his human father's glasses belonged to or what it felt like to have a mother, but nothing magical happened. So this is it, Drag stated matter off to break the silence. He closed the book and held it to his side, took a step away from where they landed, and began examining the house. I don't remember, the brunette replied, downcast. Greg actually laughed, a short deep chuckle in an attempt to lighten the mood. Come on, partner, you can't expect to remember everything in an instant. We should look around for something. He hated seeing his nephew feel so down, something that had unfortunately become the norm lately. The say wasn't moved by the suggestion. All right. I can do that. Drake patted the kid on the back, a light reassuring tap that didn't go unappreciated, then he found the stairs, deciding it was best to leave Issei to check the first floor. As the creaking of the rickety stairs began to fade, Issei forced himself to check inside the boxes. Slowly, he felt his curiosity overpower his trepidation as he began pulling things out. First, there was a stuffed bear, the kind he had as a little boy. Then he saw a picture, one of him with a big smile on his face and the number four in the background. A birthday. Issei wondered. He barely remembered which day of the year it was, much less what it felt to celebrate one. He dug in further, finding some ratty old envelopes with nothing in them and a bunch of silver utensils. There was a board game in there too with an 8x8 grid, alternating black and white squares. An image flashed in his head of a black-haired man with glasses playing against another adult, one whose face is say cold to recall. I wish I remembered what family is like, Issei sighed, frustrated. He wanted memories, not a bunch of silverware and a board game. His surname was Haidu, but he knew nothing about the Haidus. For a few minutes, he kept sifting through the junk, finding nothing useful, until there was another picture. Though it was torn and dusty, it was clearer than anything else in the box. It was them, his human parents. The ones who were supposed to raise him, not throw him away like Acnologia. The man didn't seem too happy to have his picture taken, and his eyes seemed closed, even through the thick glasses. He had messy black hair, kind of like Issei's own but shorter. The woman looked like she knew the man wasn't paying attention, about to point it out. She had uniform bangs that were eyebrow length, and the rest of her brown hair was smooth and stopped above her shoulders. Judging by the man's tuxedo and the woman's white dress, it was some important occasion that Issei didn't know. He flipped it over. It read Haidu Takeshi and Hinoka, August 28, 1993. Those must have been their names. He had no idea how the dates worked here, so that was useless. You find anything, partner? The voice made him jump. He must have been quite distracted. He passed the redeed the picture. Just this. As Dreg scrutinized the picture, he decided to voice some of his thoughts. I think I want to go outside now and learn about Japan. Is that okay? He half expected Dreg, just like Acnologia, to say no and lecture him. Of course it is. You don't need my permission. Really? The dragon rolled his eyes. If you flare your energy, it'll be there. Besides, it's midday and no battles ever happen during the day. That was true, since the one thing the three factions agreed on was not exposing themselves to random humans, which meant staying under the radar. Issei's glum expression went from surprise to a large grin. He did always love visiting the towns of Fiori after all, and he had a whole new world without the regulations and rules that bound him and the last one. Awesome. Before his uncle could appreciate the change in demeanor, the teen was off. He always was a little too free-spirited, Dreg sighed. 
The dragon wasn't too interested in exploring himself, rationalizing that the human world can't have changed much in the past couple decades. In retrospect, after learning just how far technology had come, that was probably the most humiliating thought had ever had. In the small room sat a rather average man with jet black hair and golden bangs, his feet comfortably resting on the office desk in front of him. His eyes were a vibrant purple, his most unusual feature. Resting in the palm of his hand was an odd yellow lance-like dagger with a purple jewel that he was idly tossing to himself. On the shelves lining the walls rested other heirloom-looking ancient artifacts of similar origin, ranging from armor to an unusual length of chain. He had a lot of free time, and he rather liked to think of himself as a collector of sorts. As is Ulsama. Someone yelled, almost imperceptible from the distance. He sighed, waiting for the shouting to get closer until the door slammed open with shocking force. Standing there, almost panting, was a very interesting-looking woman. She had round, clear, black-rimmed glasses that kept her strikingly green eyes visible. She wore a business suit and kept her black hair in a bun. There was also the fact that she had a stricken figure, perfect enough for Azazel to make her a secretary. Of course, she was quite the shrewd woman as well, but Azazel liked to kill two birds with one stone. Azazel Sama. Yes Val. Her name was Varial, though Azazel much preferred the nickname. It teased her and annoyed Vali as well. She seemed a little flustered at his calm tone. This is important. And why are your feet on your desk, you're supposed to be our governor general, she accused. This is why he didn't often have a secretary. Always telling him to act like his post required instead of staying calm and relaxed. So, what's the news? Our tracking division spotted an item previously thought lost, the one you ordered them to monitor for years ago. That didn't help whatsoever. You're going to have to be more specific. I've got them looking for hundreds of magical items and sacred gears. It was all for that hobby of his, trying to recreate sacred gears to aid his research on improving his own artificial sacred gear. Such was the spear he had in his hand now, called the Downfall Dragon Spear, containing the essence of the Dragon King Fafner, who agreed to aid him in his research. Their face was pink now. She was either angry at her boss, embarrassed that he wasn't acting as she thought he should, or ashamed at the familiarity he addressed her with. Certainly, though a tough fallen angel in her own right, she was an odd one. It's that book. It was called, um, something of the void. Do you mean Secrets of the Void, the spell tome that a magician stole eleven years ago? She nodded. Hmm that is important news that book contains powerful spells that only magicians can use. Burial was confused. Rarely, if ever, did humans work directly for the Grigori, the organization of fallen angels that Azazel led. When they did, they were normally stray exorcists or exiled priests, not magicians capable of high-level magic. If only magicians could use it, what worth was it to the organization? So what made you put it on the top priority list? It hides a secret it'd prefer to stay hidden, he explained. That means I'm going myself to retrieve this, and once I find it, I'll put it somewhere no one can find it. We can't have a repeat of the last time. He stood up, a few inches taller than his secretary. Despite his somewhat jovial attitude, Varial knew he was serious. She would never pry the information from him, not on his life. So where was it? The same place it disappeared, a household in Kuo, Japan. When she saw him leaving, she tried to stop him. You can't go alone, sir. She would be a suitable distraction if there was trouble. The governor general laughed. I'm not alone, Val. I'm taking Fafner with me. She scowled. That doesn't count. This is why I don't usually have a secretary. You all just don't know how to lighten up, the man pointed out with an exasperated sigh. Wait, before you go, there was more information, Varial tried in a desperate stall attempt to get the man thinking about his actions. The Grigori was having a lot of internal issues, and she cold let Azazel's leadership seem weak, and there was no way she'd stop, just because the man told her to lighten up. If he went on this trip and was injured, it could spell disaster for the organization. Oh? The Kabil didn't check in again this month. It wasn't much, but surely it was enough to get him to pause for a moment, right? His laugh resumed, making her glare even more at the leader. He is a fallen angel Val. You can't expect him to be much good at following rules. Though he said that, Azazel was counting his fellow leader's infractions. Kakabiel is getting out of hand perhaps this warranted a conversation with the fallen, but it certainly wasn't as important as the spell tome. I won't be gone long, Azazel stated as some measure of reassurance. A purple magic circle appeared under him, and his body dissolved into blue particles in seconds. Won't be gone long, my ass hell probably go to a bar afterwards, the secretary sighed, deciding that it might be a good idea to go back to financial. Azazel was a charismatic and spectacular leader, but he was an awful guy to try to manage. He did things on his own time and his own way, regardless of the consequences. He wasn't reckless, nor was he dumb, he was just an enigma that no one understood. I do hope he can handle this without incident. 
As Drake sat on the stairs and Issei was out doing whatever in the town, he had warned the kid that he could not use magic, he cold not stop thinking about the past month. After Acnologia going ballistic and finally snapping a few weeks ago, the teen had changed from his upbeat self. That was expected from such an event, but the Welsh dragon knew that his nephew would be like this for a while. That was actually why he suggested human school in the first place, to help the teen meet people his age and learn that there is more to life than what Acnologia says. Issei needed some new goals or had find himself in a bottomless pit that there was no escaping from. But, hopefully, the kid was having fun now, seeing his old home with new eyes. It was nice that, despite how Issei viewed humans and weakness in general, he never acted like that in public. That was one thing that Drake prided himself on, helping Issei to not be an ass. Gildertz was a fantastic influence in that respect as well. Ugh, Drake groaned in an epiphany, I'm a lonely dragon, aren't I? I get some peace and quiet and spend it fretting over Issei. He would have never thought he could change so much in only a few years, just because of an intimidating dragon and a bratty kid. Not only had he finally become the teacher that every boosted gear user had wished he was, he had learned how to become human and completely conceal his presence. He wasn't even plotting against Albion. Then, suddenly, a dark purple magic circle appeared in front of him, startling Drag out of his thoughts. Company already? Seems the universe has a sense of irony. He stood up, prepared to beat the tar out of whatever being was unfortunate enough to bother him. As a man materialized, the dragon's eyes widened in recognition. Azazel. He must be here for the book. His stance relaxed. Azazel eyes the reed in front of him, curious. He sensed no enormous power from the apparent human, but he could not deny the peculiar feeling in the back of his skull. Well then, he commented, mind telling me if there are any ancient relics around. He twirled his artificial sacred gear, pointing the tip at the Welsh dragon. Come on, Azazel. Is that any way to greet an old friend? That put a contemplating look on the fallen's face. Old friend. On second thought, your voice is a little familiar. Whom he took a few moments, just thinking about this. Im drawing a blank here. He had met so man people, particularly women, in his thousands of years alive. Ha! Ah, the dragon laughed with a sly grin. Last we met, I was sealed in someone's arm. No way, Azazel muttered. This man cold be drag. The boosted gear had disappeared completely eleven years ago with no sign of reappearing. It may not have affected Bali, but it surely had an impact on Azazel, who takes pride in his tracking skills with sacred gears. How is this even possible? Being released from a sacred gear, traveling dimensions, or taking a human form. He joked, making Azazel feel even more lost. I've had an unusual past couple of years. That was an understatement. So this means that the one who was sent away all those years ago was the Seeker Yuite, the Fallen pondered, connecting the dots. Another world entirely, huh? Oh, yeah, he added at the dragon's surprise, I know exactly what this book is. That is why it was so heavily guarded at the church and why my men wasted no time in retrieving it, assuming that those who stole the existence of a whole other world could bring ruin upon either their world or the other, depending on the strength of both. It was something Azazel, who had been pushing a policy of non-aggression the past few hundred years, did not desire in the least. Yes, hi do is say, Drake confirmed, before sizing up the fallen angel in front of him with a dangerous look. His goal is to learn what has become of his parents. They were the ones you chased and murdered. Whoa, hold on here, Azazel tried to placate. I didn't murder anyone, nor was I going to. I was actually going to give them a job offer once I learned the kid held the boosted gear. They are telling me that Issei's human father sacrificed himself for nothing. The pain he suffered for the last years was worthless. If there was one partner Drake had ever come to care for, it was Issei. The dragon may not have been angry yet, but Azazel had some explaining to do. The fallen knew that, if the man facing him was a heavenly dragon, a fight could only end in disaster. But, then again, Drake won't want to draw too much attention for fear of repeating his punishment from the Great War. I made a mistake, it happens. I came here today to seal the book away and keep it hidden so no one would ever find it. It was a poor decision to hide it in plain sight. Drake sighed, realizing how tense he had gotten. I don't forgive easily, just ask Albion, but I do believe that you had no intention of bringing a say harm. Speaking of, where is he? I've never seen you so worried over a human. While well, Drake may exhibit some concern over his host, it was because he was somewhat forced to, sealed away and all, and he never got this emotional. That quickly brought a chuckle from the dragon. Who said he was human? Azazel had given up on being surprised by now, his interest only growing instead. This is a long story, and it begins when Issei and I arrived in a world known as Earthland. At some point, the two had devolved into drinking liquor. Azazel fetched some glasses and a large bottle when he heard that Drake had never drank alcohol before. And now, the two were having a blast while Issei was nowhere to be seen. When Drake told him how he was released from the sacred gear, Azazel intensely probed to find out exactly what happened. 
According to Acnologia, Dragonslayer magic could wipe out all previous magics, but it was a little known fact that sacred gears were bound to the soul. Azazel suspected that becoming a Chaos Dragonslayer had purged Asay's soul completely, changing him irreversibly and forcibly removing the boosted gear. But that was only part of their story. Azazel, following Drake's tale with a glass in hand, interjected, so wait, you're telling me that this Gildert's nearly destroyed the hospital he was recovering in by accident. S absent-minded, Drake reasoned, grinning. They'll say. The Fallen took the moment to refill their cups. This stuff is great, the Welsh dragon complimented. Well, anyways. He led us to a mage that helped us get back, and here we are. Azazel placed a finger on his chin and thought, twirling the downfall dragon spear. So, you two have nowhere, but this ratty dump to stay and Issei is supposed to go to school. He summarized. To get him to forget about his father. Azazel nodded. Acnologia sounded like quite the scary figure, especially if he truly was above Dragon King level, as Drake had said. No wonder Drake preferred it that Azazel leave before Issei gets back. If all that the kid remembered about his childhood was that fallen angels killed his parents, meeting one face to face could be a bad idea right now. That was doubly compounded by the nature of chaos dragon magic and the fact that Issei was in some kind of funk. I can help with that. Of course, you won't have to worry about keeping the book safe. How can you help? Drake wondered. Typical dragon, not knowing a thing about the human world the fallen rolled his eyes. You don't have any money and you won't get Issei enrolled anywhere without an ID. Drake was crying comically now. How could I forget about that? Azazel fasipumed at the sight of the perturbed dragon. For some reason, even though he was the fearsome red dragon emperor, Drake had some odd mental breakdowns. Here, take the book, Drake pulled the item from his pocket and shoved it at Azazel, almost knocking over their drinks. Just don't tell Albion. Geez, the fallen sighed, what is it with you two? When Drake didn't answer he decided it best not to pursue that route. It'll get the both of you set up with a nice apartment and everything else you need. Azazel gathered the glasses and the bottle, there was barely any left, and made to leave. Wait, the dragon yelled. Before you go, you said you were working on doing an artificial sacred gear right? Oh, yeah. Azazel sat back down. I've got Fafner helping me make this. I call it the downfall dragon spear, he gloated proudly, showing off his creation. I've got another request, if it isn't much of a problem. Now that the governor general's interest was piqued, Drake reached into his pockets and pulled out a bunch of red and green shards. It looked like they were pieces of metal, Azazel noted. This is the boosted gear. What's left of it, Azazel joked. This isn't useful for creating a different gear without the sealing protocols and your life force. Drake shrugged. I expected as much. I'm sure that, between your genius and my experience, we could figure it out. I was hoping to give Issei a watered-down version as a gift. Issei had always wanted to use the boosted gear, and this could give also give Drake some peace of might. Though Issei was more than a match for a high-class devil, beings like dragons always attracted the worst type of attention. Um, Azazel thought aloud. It could be possible to recreate it, though it won't be nearly as useful as a Longinus. Worst case scenario, we can turn it into a twice critical. He'll contact you later with more information, but until then it was good catching up with you, Drake. Ciao. Quickly, without waiting for a response, Azazel had teleported away with a magic circle. Well, that was fun, Drake decided, feeling a bit woozy. I wonder what Issei's up to. Whoa, that alcohol was really starting to kick in now. Screw that, I think he'll take a nap. The large black dragon flew effortlessly high above the clouds, blending into the night sky. Below, millions of lights glimmered and danced, a far more spectacular sight than the average daytime city. Still, Issei cold help but feel a small sense of accomplishment. He may not have learned what the fate of his human parents was, but for the moment he didn't care. He was just relieved to have spent the day in Kuo, a place filled with whole new opportunities. Here, he had a new lease on life, and he sure as hell wasn't going to screw it up. Kuo, he discovered, was an unusual place. Earlier that day, while he was walking through town, people stared at him funny and made odd comments about his cloak. Something about him dressing up for an anime convention. It wasn't weird, people wore them all the time in Fiori, so why not here? Also, there was the incident where he went to a restaurant booth and got the best damn food had ever had. The problem? He had no way to pay for it, even when he tried forking over all of the jewels, Fiori's currency, that he kept in his pocket. Thankfully, aside from some yelling and a woman with a threatening-looking spatula, he suffered no magic shocks to his self-worth. He even escaped mostly unharmed. Okay, so maybe he had no idea how this world worked. Shouldn't I be getting back? He realized, noticing the time. Uncle's probably worried, he sighed, knowing that Drake had been way overprotective recently. As he veered right, he smelled something unusual, sinister, almost like a demon. That could be any one of the billions of things Drake tried to make me learn about, Issei groaned, trying to tell which it was. 
Yakai, devils, Yakai, devils, demons, oh man, I'm going to lose sleep over this unless I check it out. Whatever it was, surely it would be no match for a chaos dragon. As he angled his wings against the air current to slow down, a thought struck him. Oh, right, not supposed to be seen. Drag would kill me he hears about someone spotting a 20 meter long dragon. Narrowly avoiding a long-winded lecture about how much of an idiot he was, Issei shrunk back to his hybrid form and landed behind a warehouse. This is where that strange smell is coming from. Where the hell's the door? He paced around the side, looking for any form of entrance to the metal-walled warehouse. Eventually, he gave up and just punched his way in, sending metal flying. The inside was dark, even for his keen predatory eyesight. Then, he saw a pair of cat-like yellow eyes. Hum. A feminine voice hummed, who is it that intrudes on my domain? Oh god, what's rotting? It was like someone left out an entire crate of eggs, then threw old beef on it and let it stew. And Issei thought whatever lived here smelled unpleasant. Boo, a dragon. I've always wondered how one might taste. Issei shivered at the sadistic and freaky tone, feeling a bit threatened. This was one creepy woman. And this one was either way arrogant or just plain stupid to openly threaten a dragon like that. Eventually, he could make out the form of a slim, buxom woman. Shes naked. He exclaimed, immediately blushing. Her body had an hergless figure topped off with spectacular breasts, far better than Issei had seen before. The visage was ruined by the sharp teeth and the face, looking more like something that belonged to a beast than a woman. What are you? Why does it smell so bad? Didn't you know? I'm a stray devil, honey. Wow, her teeth were sharper than his with that creepy smile. And that. That's just human blood and flesh. Delicious. I'm sure you'd love a taste, dragon coon. He threw up a little in his mouth. You mean you eat people? He shivered. Gross. The fuck, lady. Damn, he had met messed up people in Fiori, though no one was this awful. If you can't appreciate such a delicacy, then you can die. Her face contorted and a magic circle appeared. Before he knew what was happening, she spat some foul-smelling, noxious yellow liquid at him. No part of this is something that I want to be involved in. Issei cried, easily avoiding it. The metal wall behind him sizzled, melting into nothing. You. This is just wrong. He dodged another stream of whatever it was then decided enough was enough. Alright, lady. You may be super hot and all, minus the face, but you don't deserve to live. Stupid dragon, you'll be my next meal. Possessed by some incredible unholy rage, she charged at Issei, her hands morphing into enormous claws. I doubt that, he drawled, gathering blue energy in his fist. Now die, the she-beast roared, her claws glowing blood red as she swiped the giant things at the teen. In a flash of light, Issei pushed off with his feet and wings, flying forward and impaling his fist directly in the stray's chest. Cho's dragon's fist. One second, his opponent had a shocked look, completely unprepared for the dragon to move so quickly. The next, the stray devil was blasted away by a wave of magic, sending light throughout the whole warehouse. Bloodied and beaten, the beast smashed into the far metal wall, denting it then falling forward. Unable to support herself, she landed flat on her face, her stomach with a large hole through the center. Jesus A complained. Drake's going to be so mad. Please the dying devil moaned, reaching a hand up. Don't look at me. You're the one who wanted to eat me, the dragon muttered, worried about his uncle. With a sigh, he sat down next to his fallen opponent. It was awkward and crushed his tail, but he was too busy thinking about something. At least I didn't flare up that much energy maybe he didn't notice. Whatever, he wasn't going to bother with killing this one. It was probably best that he get back before someone else showed up and chose to investigate. Issei quickly turned and left the warehouse, preferring to forget about his strange encounter on the flight back. After the teen left, a red magic circle appeared in the center, and two bodies began to take shape. Both were teenage women with large assets and shapely figures. One had crimson hair, the color of blood, that reached midway down her back. Her brilliant blue eyes seemed to scan through the darkness with ease. The second had knee-length dark hair tied back into a ponytail and violet eyes. While the redeed wore a typical Japanese school uniform, the other had the wide and red attire of a Maiko, a Shinto shrine maiden. Arara, violet eyes, Okeno, chuckled, looks like someone beat us to it Rias. It seems so, Rias, the leader, replied. And by the energy I felt, they were quite strong as well. They are interested, aren't you? Absolutely. This territory does belong to my household after all. That is why the two were sent to eliminate a low-class stray devil in the first place. The two were interrupted by a pained sound coming from the dying stray devil. Kill me, Yufufu, Akeno giggled, Yara resilient one aren't you? Rias faced the stray. It'll be happy to put you out of your misery if you tell me who did this to you. The stray cursed at her. Or, she continued, I could have Akeno interrogate you. Shes very into S and M. Behind the stray relented. He was a black dragon. Interesting. She gathered the red and black magic of the Gremory clan's famed power of destruction. 
Now, Began, she declared as a huge wave of energy overwhelmed the stray. There was a short scream followed by silence. The stray devil had been completely erased from existence. So, Akeno said, are we going to look for this black dragon? Rhea shook her head. It was best not to chase after trouble. No, it'd be a bad idea to mess with a dragon, doubly so since it is strong enough to remain unseen in the human world. I should warn my brother, and we should keep an eye out. Partner, you're an idiot. That was all Drake had to say after Issei gave his uncle a full recount of the day. At least no one saw him, and at least none of the devils decided to see just who or what killed their stray. One day, though, if the kid kept going on this road, he was going to screw up. He, Issei replied sheepishly, rubbing his head. No more late night flights or fights, got it. Doubt better. If you get yourself in trouble, I'm not bailing you out. Issei knew that the warning was total bull, but neither felt like pointing it out. So, I met with a friend last night. Not fair, the teen groaned. You said to stay hidden. They are doing a great job with that, Drake pointed out sarcastically. Anyways, my friend dropped off some things we need. Money, IDs, a couple brochures for schools. Schools. Oh man, you're still making me go to school, aren't you? Issei complained. Yes, and I think I found one you might be able to put up with. Really? Wondered the brunette. Yep. Drake grinned. Kuo Academy. It was an all-girls school until recently, so you'll be able to meet tons of babes. The teen rolled his eyes at his uncle. That, and they are one of the top in academics. Issei sighed. I can't wait. The day was another beautiful day at Kuo Academy. With sexy students, awesome clubs, and tolerable classes, the school had everything a teenage boy would ever need, and Issei Cole would be happier to be attending. Now a second year, Issei had found in Kuo Academy the exact distraction he needed. A year ago, had never have expected to be so accepting of the human educational system, much less coming back for another year. Then again, looking back, he was kind of a gloomy psycho with a deep unfounded dislike for those weaker than him. Had come to learn that anyone who can sit through hours of boring lessons day after day deserves a menial amount of respect. That respect for humans practically tippled when he, on a whim, joined the kendo club. Filled with girls who could smack him silly with a wooden stick, that club was something else. Sure, it would barely take him any effort to kill them all, but their skill was still remarkable. Murayama and Caddis, the co-captains, ran a tight ship and really put tons of effort into each practice, almost the same fervor that Issei had during his dragon-killing days. Maybe he was on his way to learning to see things from Gildert's perspective, and maybe Drag was right about school taking his mind off of Acnologia. Instead of brooding, Issei no longer worried about what his father was doing. He even made friends which, considering his upbringing, was a complete shock to his uncle. Every now and then, Issei would let Mireyama and Cadis into his new apartment, and the three would play games and watch movies. As it turns out, Issei had a total obsession with gaming, not that Drag would ever complain. Using Azazel's money and influence made it easy to get the kid the latest games, and the kendo club loved it. He wasn't interested in dating them, no way. Especially not after that incident with Aika Kiryu, the female counterpart to the lecherous perverted duo. He had never had a conversation so full of sexual innuendos in his life. That, and her attention was mostly on his crotch for their entire date. Yep, that is why he was totally cool with staying friends with the kendo girls. The day everything finally changed started exactly the same. He waved by to Drag who was currently passed out on the couch, tossed together some breakfast, gathered his stuff and left. As he entered the school, he noticed the same expressionless face focused on him. Kaneko Taoju, a first-year, cat-like. Hell, she even smelled somewhat like a cat mixed with something a cold place. The point was, she was a devil, and she noticed something was weird with him, and that day, like every other, she would try to find out why. Heh, I learned from the best, sucker, Issei taunted inwardly. Morning, Issei-senpai. This cute little girl, called the school mascot by many, had tomboyish white hair and a short figure. Hey, Kaneko-chan, the dragon returned with a wave, continuing to class. Like every other day, he sat through his lessons, bored out of his mind. After that ended, he went to kendo club. It was the middle of the week, so they met for a couple hours. Today, Issei was partnered with one of the newbies, whose ass he promptly kicked. It was all technique, no supernatural strength needed. One day, he was going to find himself a sword, a real sword, like the one Drake told him about, Excalibur. That was a lot more efficient than waving around a wooden stick. After Kendo, Issei decided to head directly back to the apartment. As he passed a bridge on the way back, he noticed a schoolgirl with dark black hair and a uniform from one of the neighboring academies. She was a mix between adorable and mature, and her violet eyes avoided him intentionally, though Issei could tell she was interested. Then there was the fact that she smelled a bit like a bird. A fallen angel. He guessed. Bayano. Are you Haidu Issei-san from Kuo Academy? She sounded so innocent, completely unlike a fallen. Yeah. 
I am Amano Yuma. She blushed. I've seen you around. I think you are cute and your tattoos are cool too. Yeah, the bright blue did bring a lot of attention whenever he wore short sleeves. It was kind of weird though that she just approached him now. Issei had been a Kuo for at least a year and a half now and people had stopped commenting about how strange he was and just accepted it. He had no idea how, after all this time spent undetected, a fallen angel decided to approach him now. Okay. Just where was this going? I wanted to know will you go out with me? I did he hear her right? I don't know it's all a little sudden. Besides, Issei wasn't sure dating a fallen angel was the best of ideas. Well, she was cute so that gave her points but it won't save him from his uncle. If he accepted her offer then he'd be stuck in some futile fallen angel ploy for sure. But on the other hand, refusing might be suspicious. There was always the chance that Drag's paranoia was rubbing off on him and the girl was legitimately interested because dragons, after all, are said to have quite the effect on the opposite gender. Do you not like me Issei-san? She shuffled nervously, moving close to Issei and pressing her chest against him. Not appropriate. Have to decide. Oh of course not, Yuma-san. In that innocent, virgin tone, she replied, will a kiss change your mind? Ua. He gulped. No no no, it's alright Angel-san. I mean Yuma-san. Damn, how could he have slipped up like that? It's just that this girl made him so flustered. You know him a fallen angel. She backed off, completely floored, her demeanor now far more compassed and mature. Issei rubbed his head. I'm not any good at deceiving people. I never really understood the need for all the underhanded stuff, you know. Dragons were notoriously poor illusionists, and the teen was doubly so. Drag was convinced that it was because he didn't have the best social skills, well Lissay liked to believe he was too honest for that. No, I don't. Yuma deadpanned. Well, that complicates things. My name is actually Rainer, and as you so accurately guessed, I'm a fallen angel. So, now that pleasantries are out of the way, how does a weak human like you know about us? Issei nearly growled at being so openly insulted at close proximity. Calm down. Deep breaths. What makes you think him weak, Rainer? She rolled her eyes as if it was obvious. Your aura is pathetic. I know you have a sacred gear, your slightly draconic energy tells me that much, but there is no way it's awoken. It seems she was wrong on both counts and he had half a mind to beat some sense in her. That, however, was probably a terrible idea since it would only draw more attention for mother fallen angels. Fine, he'll answer your question, Issei relented, still on edge. He had much better control than two years ago, but he didn't know how long it would hold before he incinerated her. My parents were magicians. That's news, Rainer hummed, disappointed in her ability to uncover Issei's past. She had managed to learn that he was born with a sacred gear and she knew it was a powerful one, but she had overlooked something that could have been important. And then there was the fact that she know why she was sent to monitor Issei. It would be a waste of my time to kill you and I have other places to be. What do you say we meet up Sunday at 3, by the mall? She gave him a cruel smirk. Maybe she would be able to find out more on Issei and his sacred gear before they met again. That, or he could make use of the boy instead of just killing him. She still wanted to ask him out. What exactly was her game? Issei cold even begin to understand the thoughts flowing through the fallen angel's head. It was about then when he realized that neither had moved an inch and the fallen's breasts were still stuffed against his chest. Oh okay. It's a date then, she smirked, pushing herself off of Issei. Without another word, she turned and walked away, as if suddenly uninterested. Meanwhile, at the old school building of Kuo Academy, Ria's Gremory sat cross-legged on a chair, staring intently at a chessboard. Her opponent. Akeno Himejima, fellow devil and Ria's queen. The two had been friends a long time, despite the fact that, strictly speaking, Ria's was the master and Akeno the servant. Ever since Ria's moved her base of operations to Kuo, her peerage, her group of reincarnated servants, were members of the occult research club. The only other person in the room, Yudo Kiba, was learning against the wall, watching the game. The red circle appeared in the center, and out stepped Kaneko. But you, she greeted with a nod of her head. Kaneko, I trust you have news on our cowhai. He met with a fallen angel, she replied plainly, taking a seat on the large couch. Ria's raised an eyebrow. Did you overhear anything important? No too far away, Kaneko said. The last thing someone on surveillance wanted was to tip off the person they were tailing. Issei's senses were sharp, almost too sharp, so she had to keep her distance. Um, the club president thought aloud. It's likely they think Issei has a sacred gear. My best guess is that's just going to kill him. So your intuition was right, then? Akeno supplied. That made Ria shake her head. No, something doesn't add up here, and I don't like it. Kaneko has been on edge all year because something about Issei feels dangerous. That alone was cause for concern, since she cared for her servants like family, and any threats had to be dealt with. If it was just a sacred gear, I should be able to sense it, but I can't. I can tell Issei has some type of power, but that's it. 
She usually trusted her intuition with these things, but Issei was an enigma the likes of which she had never seen before. The queen grinned sadistically. I would love to interrogate him for you, but you. Yeah, great idea, Rhea's thought sarcastically about her best friend's odd bedroom habits. I don't want to get in the fallen angel's way. Whether I like it or not, I still have to play politics, and the Gremory heir fighting with the fallen over a human wound make my father happy. There was an opinion she hadn't heard yet, and she called to Ford not to have the input. What do you think, Yudo? Yudo Kiba, her knight, had a calm head on his shoulders. You could always ask him, offered the knight. Such a straightforward guy, she expected no less from him. That's true, Rhea's thought, having considered this before. Still, she wasn't one to rush into situations, and they had next to no intel about their fellow student. There was, of course, his uncle, who called to appear more normal despite the obvious fiery hair color, the man was quite plain. He was a consultant who worked with an antiques firm and a fan of spending the night out, and he had been involved with zero supernatural events, so the chances were slim that he knew. She came to the conclusion that either Issei was amazing at hiding his true identity, and Kaneko was right to be cautious, or they were all overreacting. Knowing these two options, the redeed heir to the Gremory house decided on the one foolproof plan to figure out the answers. Kaneko, follow him and keep your distance. When he next encounters that fallen angel, try to listen in. In case they do choose to kill him, my familiar will slip him a flyer. Hopefully, that tied up all the loose ends. Rias felt a little guilty that she could be responsible for her cowhay's death, yet she knew that in the end, things would turn out for the best. After she was unable to find the dragon, she was optimistic that she won't miss out on this opportunity. By the way, Akeno. Checkmate. When Issei arrived back at the apartment, he was surprised to see that Drag was already there. The past few weeks, his uncle had been busy with work. When he had asked why Drag was gone so often, the Red Dragon only referred to their mysterious source of income and fake identities. Issei knew that the strange dragon knew someone in one of the three fractions with the resources and means to keep them hidden, but he had no idea why. Drake insisted that it was better that he was left out of the loop, and the teen had grown to accept that as the way things were. From what he knew, their mysterious benefactor had been an old friend of the heavenly dragon. What are you doing here? Issei asked, flat out. His uncle faked sadness, then grinned. I finished the project I was working on. Yes, it has to do with the man who so kindly lent us this house. Then I guess you won't tell me, figured the teen. Well, not yet. It's a birthday present. Issei was interested now. Drag knew that he thought birthdays were pointless, one of the many lessons learned during his childhood, so it must be quite the unique gift. What is it? Have you no patience, partner? His uncle accused, obviously unimpressed. No. The Welsh dragon raised an eyebrow. One word answers were bad. Issei was the rambling type, not the cold glaring type. There were very few times these days when the kid acted like this. All right, what gives? I've got a date Sunday, Issei sighed, downcast. Greg's mind was boggled. How was the kid upset, dates were one of the best things ever. Had gone on at least 30 in the past year, all with different human women, and had awesome times. Much better than dealing with female dragons, he liked to think. Yeah I've got a date, he repeated. Didn't you say the last one with that nice girl Kiryu, I think scarred you for life. Issei knew he was screwed one way or the other, so he just let it out. It's with a fallen angel, Rainer, and she's horrible. She acted all schoolgirly and innocent, then I slipped up, and she knew I knew what she was. Then she got all condescending and called me a weak human. Oh man, Drake knew that was a huge mistake on her part. Then she said I wasn't even worth killing. When I see her again, she's so dead. So, how'd you mess up? It'd say that it's unlike you, but, he was interrupted, I know, I know. It was hard to think when her boobs were pressed against me. Thoughts of breasts nearly made him stumble, so he changed his focus. She seemed really nice too. Ha! Ah, so you like her? The Welsh dragon laughed. What? No. Issei denied. I mean, she's hot, but I don't like her. She was following me around cause she thought I had a sacred gear. Plus, she's not my type. Greg rolled his eyes, knowing that his nephew didn't have a type, even if cruel, mean, and bitchy wasn't it. The last thing he wanted was anyone to remind him of a certain black dragon, especially someone he was dating. I think you are just being shy. Still, this was out of a serious situation, not time for jokes. So, you say she was following you because she suspected you had a sacred gear. I suppose that your magic power does come off in a way similar to how a sacred gear feels. But there are tons of humans with sacred gears. Why would a fallen angel bother with following me? That's a good question, considered Drake as he thought up possibilities. There was no way that Azazel put her up to this, was there? If he did, there were definitely no orders to threaten, much less kill the teen. Azazel wasn't stupid enough to send his subordinates to their deaths, but maybe he still wanted to keep an eye on Issei. That would mean he didn't trust Drake, despite their year of reconciliation, which was a smart move on his part. 
smart, devious, and totally uncalled for, exactly like one would expect from a fallen angel. But he probably should not jump to conclusions and get riled up based on mere suppositions. Dragons were honest, often brutally so, which meant his first course of action would be to just ask the Grigorous leader, though he doubted he'd get a straight answer. I don't know, partner. I've got someone I can ask, but in the case that fails, I've got a backup plan. Backup plan? Yep. She probably wants to get some more information out of you, and we're going to do the same right back. That was followed by an odd, scheming look. First, though, I'm going to need to teach you about girls. Oh great, Issei could tell this was going to be a disaster. Over the next couple days, Issei had noticed that the devils at school were paying extra special attention to him. Of course, he wasn't worried, and Drake claimed that it was to be expected with a fallen angel in their territory meeting up with him. The teen knew that Drake's optimism at their ability to remain hidden was completely unfounded, and the old dragon was too apprehensive at being found out to accept the obvious. To be plain, Issei was growing annoyed at his uncle's paranoia. If he had that kind of power so that he was even stronger than his father, no one could force him into hiding. He'd be proud and confident, like he was raised to be. The dominoes were falling, Drake's original plan had come up empty, and Issei was on his way to meet the one who knocked over the first one, Rainer. Somehow, he just knew that this Sunday was going to suck. Alright, I'm at the dang mall and it's 3.30, he complained. He should have known that the fallen angel was the exact type to keep him waiting just for her own amusement. I wonder if she'll even show. Drake, using whatever magically contact he had, was unable to find out anything at all about Rainer. According to him, she was supposed to check in on Issei once, simply to make sure that the kid was acting normal. Nothing beyond that. So, in other words, the two had no idea what she was doing following up on Issei, an action probably well above her pay grade. Just then, he was shocked out of his thoughts by an unfamiliar black-haired girl tripping in front of him, spilling flyers all over the place. Are you alright he asked, as she shuffled around to pick up all of them. Weird, they look like magic circles, and have the words I will grant your deepest desire on them he thought as he picked up a few, placing them with her pile. After all of them were picked up, she placed one in his hand and smiled, not saying a word. Her teeth are a bit sharp for a human, and something else about her is funny too, he noticed, but she wasn't a devil or fallen angel. Shrugged, he put the flyer in his pocket as she took off as quickly as she came. Man, he was just the epicenter of weird wasn't he. Finally, Rainer was here. Her clothes were far more revealing than the last time the two met too, and she was a couple inches taller, but she couldn't change her scent. Dressed as something between a stripper and a hardcore military chick, she was quite the sight, barely blending in with typical human dress at all. Oh man, I forgot to dress up. Shoot, he was in a blue Portal-themed shirt and black pants, way too lame for a date. Portal was a cool game for sure, though hardly a good theme for dressing fancy. You weren't waiting long, were you? She gave him an insufferable smirk. Nope, Issei shot back, only 30 minutes. Barely even noticed. Ahahaha, she chuckled, it seems you have got some fire after all. Maybe this date isn't a complete waste of my time. It better not be a waste of mine, he replied in kind. They were having dinner at Issei's favorite American food joint. It wasn't the fast food kind, more the diner variety, but they served a mean hamburger. As the two occupied a booth right by the window, they stared intently at each other, as if waiting for the other to say something. Eventually, the tension was getting too infuriating for Issei. So, you follow me around then ask me on a date when you clearly have no interest. Why? Oh, who said I'm not interested? Raynor giggled in a tone somewhat unlike her. I haven't been with a man in a long time. Humans just don't do much for me anymore, and I guess I intimidate some of the others in my generation. Really? He was kind of unprepared for that answer. It seemed almost genuine. I thought you just wanted to learn about my past and my sacred gear. Aren't those both things a girl should know about a potential boyfriend? Damn these rhetorical questions, they were getting old. Clearly, she was teasing him. Fine. A trade was in order then. He'll tell you if you tell me why. The fallen rolled her eyes, shifting her shirt to expose more cleavage. Loosen up, will you? We're on a date, Issei Kun, not at a funeral. As for why, I guess you surprised me is all. The son of two magicians, wandering around with a sacred gear and no one to teach him how to use it. I could give you the guidance you need, she proposed suggestively. This woman had no shame, none at all. If Issei wasn't so uptight about this, he'd certainly be enjoying the sight of a beautiful woman very nearly exposing herself in public for him. So that's what this is, a job offer. I can offer you a lot more things than just a job, she stated lewdly, caressing his cheek across the table. His face flushing red, he managed, that's really nice Ray-chan. They are quite cute when you get like that, the fallen chuckled, sitting back in her seat. Issei tried to divert his attention, as if refusing to indulge her. Why don't we start learning about each other? We're on a date after all, she smiled. 
The dragon kept silent, his gaze drifting unintentionally towards her skimpy clothes. You don't trust me, do you? The fallen was right on the mark with that one. You're a smart boy, is a coon. Why do you care so much? What's so important about me? Nothing. The higher-ups wanted me to observe you for one day and see if you get into trouble because I heard rumors the leader is interested in your sacred gear. Ah, but that isn't what I'm doing, is it a Seikun? I think they're downsizing your potential. Working for me? I could give you anything Yao'd want, even me. She gestured to herself. She grinned. I guess you could say that Yao've made me very curious, magic boy. Ha, hey, doesn't take much to get you curious, does it? He observed. Ha. She laughed. I guess I don't like things I can't understand. Fatal flaw, she joked. Really, though, Issei knew she thought she was near flawless, and she was far too prideful for the power she held. I'm fine not knowing things, Issei replied. Magic and all of that it's so freaking cool but it makes no sense. Why was he actually conversing with her like this? Sure, Drake did tell him that the best way to get info was to give some, making sure yours was less useful, but he was actually telling her things he had never told anyone save Drake and Gildert's. Really? I suppose that's for the best. There is stuff out there that humans never be able to make sense of. She wasn't even going to bother explaining what a sacred gear was. In fact, she assumed that Issei already had a good idea of their history for some reason. Your parents were magicians, learn any magic. Both died when I was five, Issei stated. He didn't feel anything about it, and Rainer knew it. So, no. My uncle's normal and never knew them. Half-truths, the best way to lie. He had to thank Drake for putting the words in his mouth, since he was awful with deception. Such a shame. Mine died as well. It's sad that the numbers of the three factions dwindled so much from the war. Thankfully, the new generation is said to have such promise, and I'm the strongest of them. Man, she cold to resist gloating, could she? So you think you're strong, huh? I can easily dispatch a mid-class devil. Issei huffed internally. Yeah, well I bet I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of your leaders. Though that made him happy that he was much stronger, he was nowhere near his goal of taking down a dragon king. That he hadn't trained much in the last year wasn't helping his confidence in this moment. That's impressive, he lied through his teeth. You think so? Raynor smiled, placing a hand on his. Issei almost blushed at the gesture of affection, instead settling on a similar smile. Yeah. Most humans cold and contend with a fallen angel like you. That was a sort of passive-aggressive compliment between Issei's own parents' demise and his genuine approval of her relative strength, compared with her fellow fallen. At least he wasn't talking with the runt of the group, even if the strongest was still an ant compared to his own power. They are sweet, you know that, Issei Kun. Tell you what, next date, he'll show you to a couple of Grugorous magicians as a thank you. Issei almost didn't catch the clever reintroduction of her offer. Next date. Oh yes, I'm having fun. Arent you. Well, I guess it's okay. Better than his last one with Kiryu at least. You need seriously need to let go. Life's better when you show your wild side. Wild side? Rainer grinned. Tell me Issei. Have you ever gone to a club before? Issei had no idea when, throughout the entire crazy ass date, that he began to see Rainer as more than a total bitch. She was smart, cunning, and resourceful, even though her arrogance, disrespect, and poor sensing ability were kind of a letdown. Maybe should have been nicer if he told her what he was, he wondered a couple times, nearly spilling the beans. Then he remembered Drake telling him that that was exactly what she desired, Issei's deepest secrets, and the last thing the brunette wanted to do was drag his uncle into this. That meant enduring the date, even though it didn't turn out as bad as he thought it would. Rainer even took him to a club. It was a little unusual, being around 6 in the afternoon and all, and that he was only 17, but he had a surprisingly good time. Despite the fact that he wasn't the type of person to go to clubs, he recognized the ability to drown away woes and worries with loud music and inappropriate dancing. At one point, she insisted they have sex, but that crossed the line. No way in hell would Issei screw someone who is as big of an asshole as her. And then there was the whole complicated emotions bit that certainly didn't help. Now, the two were finishing their date, walking hand in hand through the park. See, Issei Kun, this date wasn't so bad after all. Eh, uh, I guess. He wasn't sure how to respond to the comment. Look, Rainer sighed. I don't know what fucked you over in the past to make you so closed off, and I don't care. This was reassuring and positive advice already. Not. I was an angel. I fell cause I like to have fun every now and then, and now you know that the rest of my faction and I aren't as horrible as you thought. Wow, she was good at reading him. How in the name of God did she know that he disliked fallen angels for what happened in his past? Was she guessing at that, or was he reading too far into her comment? I suppose the club was alright. Had never seen so many beautiful women in one place, not even at his mostly girls school. Alright. She almost laughed. You know you had a good time, Issei-kun. The offer still stands. You could join the Grigori. 
Now, you may be a weak, naive human, but I'm sure we could find a way to make you at least competent. To be honest, the proposition was a bit more tempting now that had learned about her. The manipulative party girl, kicked out of heaven, trying to make name for himself was certainly far more three-dimensional than the asshole she first painted herself to be. However, he still had his obligations to drag, and he wasn't about to join one of the factions. If he did, there was no way that people won't discover that a heavenly dragon, a being that once had the capability to destroy the world, had been unsealed. Yeah, that would be bad. I'm sorry, Ray-chan. He had no idea why he bothered with the nickname. Do I really like her? He wondered vaguely, not understanding a bit of it. I can't. That made her surprisingly upset. Yar sure. Yeah. I'd rather keep to myself. Erg, she groaned, taking her hand away from his and stepping in front to face him. She was standing in a few feet in front, a fountain right behind her. Why cold you have just accepted? I wasn't lying when I said I was starting to like you, Issei. You were a nice challenge for a girl like me, she smirked, removing the affectionate tone almost completely. Almost. That he exclaimed, confused. A challenge. She ran a hand across his cheek again. Oh, Issei. You were so childish at times, but you never opened up completely. I wanted to pry every little thing out of that little head of yours and use it to get you to work for me, but you insist on being so damn determined. So, this was how it ended. Exactly as Drake said it would, and Head stupidly thought that she actually had grown to like him in that twisted way of hers. Even after admitting that she was trying to trick him, he fell for the same gag a second time. Yar pathetic. He could imagine his father's taunts at his situation. You call yourself my son. Shut up shut up Issei muttered. Such a foolish human, ordering me around. Rainer cackled. I think it's time you learned not to look a gift horse in the mouth. She stepped back, feathery black wings spreading out from behind her as she took to the skies, hovering a few feet in the air. They are like his wings he noticed. So weak to imitate a king of dragons so poorly. A spear of bright radiating light, far too holy for the hands of such a demon, formed in front of her. Sadly, the joke is over. It's time for you to die. She threw it. Issei barely registered the pain as it collided with his stomach, burning a large hole in his shirt. You didn't even react, Rainer gloated. Pathetic, Issei murmured, gazing downwards at where the spear hit him as it faded into nothing. What? The fallen exclaimed, sure had easily one shot at him. You can still stand. I was pathetic he gazed up at her, his normally hazel eyes contracted into thin slits. To believe you actually cared his stomach, she realized, it was completely unharmed. There was a red mark, a small sign that he had actually been hit by the attack, but there was no way a human could resist this so effortlessly. The light spear should have been buried through his body. The dark navy-colored aura started leaking out, casting a sinister feeling around the surroundings. I don't know why I'm so weak. Human, ha. Huh? Why did I even pretend to be one? Right then, Raynor knew that she was in deep shit. This aura that he was radiating was incredible, far stronger than she could ever hope to match. And she had insulted him, taunted him, manipulated him. Weak, he commented taking a step forward. Raynor, instinctively, moved back in sync. He shouldn't do this, he still had control. Still I'm, I'm not a killer. The aura and killing intent in the air certainly said otherwise, but she wasn't going to argue. What are you doing? What was this, a memory? Issei was twelve, and it was the first time had ever fought a dragon without his father's help. The victim was a particularly weak one, one that even a young Issei was able to overpower with chaos dragon magic and liberal use of an advanced form of Dragonforce. An earth dragon, name unimportant to him, lay dying, her normally rock-hard scales shattered into bits and leaking blood. What are you doing? His father shouted, watching Issei stare at his opponent. Was it admiration? Trepidation. Acnologia glared at him, anger seeping through. Is this not what you wanted? Power. It called you weak, undermined your existence. Why do you wait to eliminate such an unworthy adversary, one who does not deserve to live? Eliminate her? Yes, he could do that. She was weaker than him, right, and only the strong deserved to live. That was why his father taught him to ignore the existence of humans because they were a disgrace to his philosophy. You are my son, Issei Haidu. The dragon roared, his mere voice tearing up the very ground, dust and earth flying everywhere. You should learn to act like it. And so the first of many died. Act like it. Like his son Issei considered, taking another step. Im not him it wasn't convincing. Finding reasons to spare the fallen he had actually considered on taking for a second date was becoming harder by the second. Be a better man than your father, Drag had once told him, but he didn't know if he could do that. He had to make his decision now, and he did. Leave, now. Or I will kill you. The fallen angel did not need to be told twice, taking off with unimaginable speed, as if the terror of God himself was right on her heels. Black feathers fell from the sky as the fleeing girl vanished from sight. Issei took a breath. Calm down. Shes gone. Yar not weak. 
He repeated the simple sentences, trying to beat the mantra into his thick skull. Im nothing like him, he assured himself. He admired the dragon, and he tried to tell himself that was wrong. Someone stronger, more confident, wouldn't have indulged her from the start. Hell, they wouldn't be blending in like a coward. Im not a coward. He bit out. Chaos dragon magic had an unfortunate side effect on the user's psyche, one that Issei was aware of, but didn't care about at the moment. All he could feel was his rage building. Howard, such a distasteful word. Its context referred to something without the gall to stand up for itself, and Issei never wanted to think of himself as that kind of coward. Speaking of the word, there was an unlucky cat snooping from behind the bushes. She was a coward, just like him. Come on out, Kaneko-chan. You happy, now, huh? He had caught her tail only 30 minutes back, though he suspected she had been following for much longer. Said devil stepped out from behind the bushes, betraying a look of slight concern. This was not the essay she knew, even if the two barely had much contact in the past. There was no way this was the gentle, awkward, kind-hearted yet mysterious member of the kendo club she had been observing for the past couple weeks. She knew he didn't mean to be harsh. After what happened with Rainer, he felt betrayed, violent, and the last thing he wanted to do was take it out on a nice cowhai, even if she was a devil. But before he stalked home to drag, he had one more thing to say. Tell Ria's Gremory I'm done hiding. You alright, partner? Issei had barged into the house, magic power still leaking off his body like wispy steam, glaring at the wall. Obviously, something was wrong. In a detached tone, he answered, I'm fine, drag. Bad date, huh? The red dragon figured, taking a seat on the couch. She was so weak, so pathetic, he muttered, sitting next to his uncle. Sometimes, I think dad was right. This was taking a turn for the worse. Never in the past year had Issei called his father dad, preferring to reference him indirectly or dance around the topic. While he may be pretty bad at counseling, Drake thought of himself as the only being in two worlds who could tell what exactly was on the kid's mind. Well, asides from when women were involved, he was an open book then. Right about what? He ventured. Our. I gained nothing from hiding. She thought herself above me. Me, the son of Acnologia. Oh man, Issei was definitely on track to landing himself in the deep end. He sounded upset, likely angry at himself for being unable to decide whether to follow his father's teachings or uncle's advice. Acnologia had the devastating effect of making Issei detest his own weakness. She toyed with me drag, and when I refused to join her useless organization, she tried to kill me. You didn't kill her did you? Drag wasn't too concerned about the ramifications of actually killing the woman, he just preferred it if Issei tried to stay calm and value others' lives more. Issei bared his teeth in a very inhuman gesture. I'm not my father. Maybe it wasn't all bad after all. I'm weak I didn't have it in me. Trust me, the Welsh dragon smirked lightly, Yav got in in you, partner. Had seen it plenty of times, enough that it unnerved him. But you are right, you are rent acnologia. You are better. So why don't I feel better? Losing control and nearly obliterating some girl because she tricked him. Wasn't too much of an overreaction when he was in no real danger the whole time. Acnologia would tell him that she wasn't even worth acknowledging in the first place, and if he was betrayed by her, then he should kill her, no questions asked. No matter what magic you use, you aren't going to become a psycho, so calm down and breathe, partner. He got the feeling that Issei wasn't too comforted by the advice. I'd rather go crazy than keep sitting on my ass like this. It's making me go senile, like you. Nice, really nice partner, Drake sighed. He knew the teen didn't mean it and was just being rash, but still. Issei hated that one of the two heavenly dragons was content with living a boring life when, for millennia prior, he had been at the forefront of every adventure. Without the continual fight with Albion and the struggles of helping the host of the boosted gear, Dreg had no goals for himself. The reason he didn't want to be resealed and thus kept them hidden was supposedly for his nephew, but Issei had trouble believing that. I've fought plenty and terrorized enough, but you are a thousand years too young to know if I'm senile or not. Issei scoffed. I'm almost an adult. No, you're 17. You're still a whelp in dragon terms partner, whether you like it or not. Maybe I am being too paranoid though. He'll tell you what, you can do whatever you want now, but don't expect me to bail you out. Issei was strong enough to take care of himself, true, and he wasn't so powerful that he was a threat to the world. Perhaps it was time to treat the kid like all of the other hosts of the boosted gear, and not solely as his nephew. Really? He seemed hopeful now, a good leap from just a few seconds ago. Yao will finally stop it with the factions are out to get us talks. Yeah. Go show those devils at school what it means to be the son of a dragon king. Though Issei wasn't sure how he really felt about Acnologia, he was still proud to be his son. A bit confusing, but Issei loved that he would inherit such an esteemed mantle. And Rhea's Gremory was about to learn just what that meant. School, unsurprisingly, seemed kind of lame after Sunday's events. 
Issei had put up with Rainer, gone to a nightclub, and nearly went insane, and he was expected to pay attention in math class. Well, that didn't happen at all. Mureyama, during lunch, pointed out that he seemed a bit off, and she was absolutely right. His response was simply that his date sucked, though the kendo captain wasn't convinced. Issei was usually pretty upbeat, so she knew it was far worse than he was letting on, but she knew better than to pry into her friend's life. Ever since she first saw him, had been a mystery. Even after calming down and realizing how worked up had gotten, the thought still lingered in his head. Am I really strong enough? Was my father right about some of this? Instead of taking notes, he was busy gazing out of the window. In more than a simple daydream, he was lamenting the fact that he hadn't gone flying at all in the past year. It never really bothered him till now how accepting he was of blending in. The clouds, the sky, the wind, all were things that he felt like he could hardly remember. How was Drag okay with this? Hey, everyone a calm, polite male voice interrupted his thoughts. Only one person sounded that princely, the so-called Prince of Kuo, Yudo Kiba, a devil. Issei turned to see the handsome young blonde standing with a kind smile. It seemed he had interrupted class, and the girls were all too happy that he chose to visit. Man, he gets all the cute girls, doesn't he? Issei moaned. And probably less crazy ones too. Though, if he knew anything about Yudo's fangirls, some might be just as insane as Rainer. When he noticed that the prince was walking across the room, a thought struck. Wait, Hess not the one they sent to get me, is he? I do Issei-san. The blonde addressed respectfully. Issei and Kibikun is a couple. Cadis murmured to Mureyama, that's so adorable. It ship that, Mureyama replied back, unknowing that Issei's enhanced hearing easily caught it. The two dissolved into comments and giggles, and the dragon rolled his eyes. They may have been his friends, but they were plenty weird. Oh, wait, had Yudo said something? I said, Ria's Gremory asked me to fetch you. Well, who am I to deny such a hot girl? Issei grinned. Lead the way, pretty boy. The old school building didn't look that old at all. In fact, it was equally as nice as the normal campus, just a whole lot more antique styled, perfect for all things occult. For some reason, the image of devils in a modern business meeting room made Issei smirk. The occult research club room itself had candles, old style lamps, and Victorian couches, all throwing the occult theme in your face. What was unusual, though, was the shower built into the side of the room. And someone was currently in it. So, this is the occult research club, Haidu san, Kiba introduced. Hey Kineko chan, greeted Issei. Sorry about last night. The adorable mascot remained emotionless. Accepted. You were within reason to be upset. Wait, so who else was in Rias Peerage, Issei wondered. He could smell a bunch of devils at the school, but he only bothered with figuring out who Kaneko's master was, since she had spent a while following him. Obviously, Yudo was a member, but who else? But, there was one thing to get off his chest first. What is Rias doing naked in the shower? Naked. He could see her silhouette through the curtain, and he cold stop himself from staring at his senpai's bust. How is her figure so perfect? For a moment, he sympathized with the infamous perverted duo, but just for a moment. Ara Ara, sneaking a peek are we? That was a Keno Himajima. She had luscious black hair that reached down past her knees, striking violet eyes sort of like Rainer's, and probably the biggest rackus he'd ever seen. As a teenager, he had trouble taking his eyes off of her well-proportioned features. After noticing that had been staring, he blushed. Not at all. But, in my defense, there is a shower in your clubhouse. True but you are still being a pervert. Issei nearly face faulted. Oh Kaneko-chan, you wound me. So, Akeno said, you must be high to Issei. Im Himajima Akeno, Rias Queen and Vice President of the Occult Research Club. If you need anything, just ask, everyone here is very nice. Man, she had such a suggestive tone. They'll keep that in mind. She winked. MMM, I hope so. I apologize for the wait. It seemed that the race Gremory, the king herself, was done with her shower. Rias had stepped out dressed in her Kuo uniform, which did little to hide her natural curves. There was a reason she was considered the most beautiful girl in Kuo, and it wasn't just the foreign look and the silky red hair. I know it's terribly rude, but I thought it better if I washed up for our guest. That was unusual, but welcome. No no no, it's great. I mean fine. Damned it hormones, they always won in these instances. Rias laughed. You're quite the interesting one, hi do is say kun. Can I call you Ice Kun? The nickname already? They didn't even know each other well. I I don't see why not. Perfect, she smiled. Everyone here is a devil in the service of the House of Gremory, though I prefer to call them my family. Yudo is my knight, Kaneko is my rook, and Akeno is my queen and longtime best friend. It seemed that they got along well. I guess you already know me, Issei replied sheepishly. You did cause quite the stir yesterday, Rias affirmed with a smile, taking a seat on the couch. Kaneko heard your claim that you are not human. To be able to stay undetected for two whole years is no small feat. 
Kaneko's one of the best sensors I know, and she was barely able to pick up on you. Her voice lost a little of the light tone, if just for a moment. You must be skilled to hide all that energy. He. I suppose I'm good at staying under the radar. He was a little embarrassed at the praise to be honest, though mostly because it was coming from a beautiful woman. It has to do with my markings on my body and some tricks taught by my two mentors. When an Earthland dragon used a human form, they kept a distinctive characteristic or pattern that transferred over, hence the markings on his arms. They were the sign of a dragon slayer whose magic had changed their body completely, but it still allowed them to flawlessly remain human, though the marks would never go away. They were a sign of who he was. Interesting. They always did grab my attention, the king commented. What exactly happened with the fallen angel, if you don't mind me asking? If there was any time to get the truth off his chest it was now. Now more hiding, he had said, and he wasn't about to continually try to lie. That was not what a dragon should do. Ray-chan thought I had a sacred gear, so she took me on a date to get close, and she was kind of pushy to get me to join the Grigori organization. I suspected as much, Rhea's hummed in thought. I take it you refused. She didn't like that much, Issei joked. Rhea smiled too. I don't imagine she would have. So, after all that, do you know why you are here? Well, there couldn't be too many options here. Don't you want me to leave your territory? That was an important thing, right? Both dragons that raised him had told him such. The Grimmery chuckled. No, no, nothing like that. I just have a question to ask you. She probably wants to know what I am or if he'll join her peerage. Devils, even ones as nice as the Grimmery clan, were still selfish by nature. He had expected that coming in. What is it? Are you okay? Did he hear her right? Huh? Are you okay? She repeated. I can't in good conscience ignore the troubles of someone Kaneko befriended. If Shes concerned, then I am too. Last night, the aura you leaked out was powerful and dangerous, and she claimed it was quite unlike you. How noble of her. Maybe the Gremory clan was a whole other breed of devils, one who truly cared for their servants. It seemed Ria's was incredibly serious about this too. That kindness definitely deserved an answer, even if had struggled with telling the full story. I guess my father was tough, and whenever I use my magic, I'm reminded of him. It was the first time had ever told anyone besides Drag and Gilderts of his problems with Acnologia, and it was great to get even this small tidbit off his chest. So, your father was like that. I've seen my share of unsolved family problems Rhea's muttered, a hollow look in her water blue eyes, making Issei wonder just what she was referring to. It is in the past Kaneko interjected. Yes, the red-haired king agreed. It's best if we move on for now. Okay, so if Rhea's wasn't going to address the elephant in the room, it seemed he had to. Don't you want to know who I am and what I'm doing here? Of course I do, Ria's replied easily. I've never seen anyone like you before, Ice Coon. Tell us whatever you want to, I won't pressure you. I don't get it he said. Why was the Redeed being so casual about this? And yet, for some reason, he felt as if he wanted to keep telling her what was plaguing him, and there was no deceit or underhanded magic involved. Still, I made a big deal about not hiding anymore, so it'll give you some answers. I don't have a sacred gear at all, the reason I have that feeling is cause I'm actually a dragon. He changed his hand and forearm to make them look dragon-like with the smooth black scales, blue markings, and deadly claws. The devils also noticed his magic power increase enough to be easily felt and recognized. He waved his hand made it human again, his energy going back to normal levels. Ara Ara, Akeno interrupted, a dragon that can change shape. Issei must have been quite strong to have that kind of magic. Most dragons, at least the ones Rias knew from the familiar forest, weren't intelligent. And the powerful ones that were sentient were completely incapable of even the simplest of non-dragon magic. All except Tiamat, at least, and she was rumored to be the strongest of the dragon kings, so where did that leave Issei? Wait. Rias realized. It was you two years ago that took care of that stray, wasn't it? That would explain how a dragon would have seemingly disappeared, though I never would have guessed he became a cute little cow high at this school. Issei felt his cheeks heat up. She didn't hold back any affection at all, not even to a mostly stranger. I remember that stray devil. She was freaky, even worse than my date yesterday. He shuddered at the memory. So, yeah, my uncle insisted I go to a human school because Hess completely insane and overprotective. Dragons weren't made to sneak around, you know. Yes, your race tends to be the straightforward type, she observed, having met a couple devil dragons in her time. There were very few of those, the most known one Tannen, a former dragon king. Dating a fallen angel must have really been tough on you, wasn't it? I do admire your commitment to try to live a normal life, even with a Grigori breathing down your back. Uh, thanks, I guess. You are not the kind of devil I expected. She nodded, able to understand exactly what he meant. We Grimmeries care for our family, an unusual belief that is looked down upon by some other devils. 
I also care for the students at this school, whatever or whoever they may be. That sounds nice to say complimented, reminded of his childhood. My father, the one who taught me what it meant to be a dragon, told me misplaced affection made people weak. You don't sound like you believe him. I don't know is say replied. Gilderts told me it made people stronger than ever when they had loved ones to protect. You seem like you would do anything for them. I will, Ria's replied seriously, before her features softened again. Oddly, she didn't pursue a say about this Gilderts person. Speaking of family. Is your uncle a dragon too? Oh no, he couldn't tell her the truth here. Drake may have given him free reign, who is say doubted he also permission for his identity to be revealed. Then again, Ria's had surprised him at all corners with how honest she was for a devil. Maybe there was some small exaggerations and clever manipulation of their chat, but it was leaps and bounds better than Rainer. He didn't even trust his two closest friends with the truth about himself. Ria's though, she was everything those two were and more. Confident, compassionate, smart, why should he trust her? That's the toughest dragon I know. He grinned proudly at that, glad to have such an uncle. Ria saw the admiration in her cowhay's expression. He'd love to meet him one day. He say, he'd like to extend to you an offer. He was a little apprehensive. If she brought him into the same rage head had the last night had hated, if anything happened to such a nice, beautiful woman. Even after you saw what happened to the last one who said that. Eh, I suppose I am a little reckless. But you won't harm me, would you, Ice Coon? She crossed her legs. Besides, I wasn't going to try to make you a devil. That's your decision, and I'm sure you'd tell me if you wanted that. Dragons were decisive and sometimes a bit brash about their desires, and Rhea saw no reason that to say, even if was a little awkward, would be much different. The offer is for you to join the occult research club. You may not be a member of my peerage, but you could be around others that you can relate to, and it'd consider you the closest thing to family. Devil work might even be fun, y'all see. I'm already in the kendo club, Issei pointed out. Rhea's rolled her eyes good-naturedly at the unimaginative response. This club's more of a front. It would rarely detract much time from kendo. It is strange, I've never met a dragon who uses a sword. I don't, he said, use a sword, I mean. Heh, uncle thought it was weird too, saying my claws were plenty sharp, I like it though. It never had to learn skill and not strength before. Issei realized he wasn't addressing the more important issue at hand, the hanging question that Rias had asked. Oh, right, sorry. It'd like to join your club. Sounds fun. Think I could get any good fights in. Later it'll get Yudo to help with your kendo. Hesa talented swordsman, you know, and I'm sure it would be fun to watch you in action. So, what's next? The kendo put a hand to her mouth and chuckled at the dragon's impatience. Ria's was the one to reply, though, being the leader and all. You should probably be leaving, unless you want to miss practice. Our late Kaneko elaborated. I am? I could have sworn it was an hour from now. Issei panicked, flailing around for a couple seconds. Oh man, I've gotta go. See ya. He got up and began running for the door. Meet us here tomorrow after your club. Ria's called after him, amused by his antics. As the occult research club processed what just happened, Ria's thought over their newest member. Obviously, she wanted him as a servant, since a powerful dragon in her peerage would be the talk of the underworld. Maybe then she could stand a chance against him and maybe Issei would one day be as famous as Tannen. Though, she would only reincarnate him if that's what he wanted. She wasn't a slaver, since she cared far more about saving worthy lives than taking them. I can't wait to see where this goes, she commented. Yufufu, Akeno giggled, you and me both. End of the here. So that's it for today's video guys, before you go just like the video and share it with your friends. Bye.